I go to the set. There's lights everywhere, half-naked girls sitting in makeup chairs getting their makeup done. I'm like, you should do this. What am I gonna do? Like, how could I leave? And everyone's just acting like it's the most normal thing in the world. There was a camera on my shoulder at some times, like boom mic, like super close to my face. Never made eye contact with a girl. Whatever I thought it was gonna be like, it wasn't like that. I was born when my mom was 16. The relationship that I had or didn't have with my father was very different than everyone else. Like I didn't know how to ride a bike. I didn't know how to like use any tools or, or do any like quote unquote man stuff. I felt the absence of something that I felt like I needed. When I was um, 13, my mom and I, we were at a mall and they had this like model search. So I met with this agent and you know, we, we hit it off. From a young age, had a very high achiever personality and feeling the very real feelings of inadequacy because I don't, I don't have this father. I started to seek validation or affirmation through relationships with girls or making the grades or making the shot. And then modeling and acting was another way to kind of fill that gap in my heart. Not having a father at home, I think it was almost worse for me in some ways because it wasn't that he was gone. He just wasn't there. But at the same time, he was in close enough proximity for me to know most aspects of his life. I just continued to, to fill that gap with wrong choices. As a you know, six two white male that has brown eyes and brown hair, there's millions of me in the industry. For me, I'm like, okay, if I put myself in a closer proximity to this industry I wanna be in, it just makes sense. So why not make this giant leap and move to Hollywood? <laughs> so I just move out there and then my money was running out, so I ended up meeting this guy, and he was working at this, this restaurant, and um, he was like, everyone that works here is in the industry as well. It's just kind of what people do. I got hired on the spot and literally started training the next day. You know, this is in West Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard, like in the middle of everything. There were girls, you know, it was almost like a, a spring break destination every day. I would meet someone knowing that I would never see them again. That hookup culture that, that started really in high school was really escalated. I had the opportunity to, to meet and know that there was no real commitment there because I would probably never see them again. One day, four girls, they come and sit down, like really early in the conversation, they said, hey, have you ever considered acting? And I thought like, great, like this is an opportunity, they're working on a project. There's gonna be something about this interaction that's gonna be beneficial to me, getting plugged in and doing something that's gonna advance what I want to accomplish. But very quickly they said, hey, um, we're talking about porn and the mental like e-break, <laughs> um, just like, wow. Um, to be honest, like I, I, I was saying, yeah, 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 sounds awesome. But in my head, I was like, no way. Like, no way I'm gonna do that. I guess like the curiosity and then also the affirmation of them saying like, you would be great, you should do it. It landed me in a, in a in a mental tug of war where I agreed to meet with their agent. When I had the interaction with the agent, it was a it was a relatively brief conversation. He was like, what do you want to accomplish? I want to be an actor and I guess I want to be famous. He very quickly pivoted into, great, um, you're a good looking guy. There's not a ton, ton of good looking guys in the industry. You can be the guy, you can be famous. Everyone will know your name. You'll have the, the things that you're saying that you desire. The next morning, I go to the set and there's a receptionist that hands me paperwork. There's lights everywhere, half naked girls sitting in makeup chairs getting their makeup done. And then someone walks up to me and puts a, a blue pill in my hand. I go to the bathroom, I'm like talking to myself, like, you should do this. What am I gonna do? Like, how could I leave? I just felt like, you know, a, a kid that was at a party he didn't wanna be at. And everyone's just acting like it's the most normal thing in the world. 
I walk over and the director is telling me literally what to do every step of the way. There was a camera on my shoulder at some time, boom mic, like super close to my face. Never made eye contact with a girl. It was almost like we were in two different places the whole time. Whatever I thought it was gonna be like, it wasn't like that. And just thinking like, that was a huge mistake. And thinking also, I would never do that again. A lot of people started finding out. Soon after that, I get a phone call from my representation, my mainstream agency, and them saying, we have to let you go. And that was pretty discouraging because that's why I was out there. Maybe a day later, I get this phone call from my mom, Joshua Luke. Were you in a porno movie? I mean, it was pretty humiliating to have your mom ask you something like that, but also just knowing what my mom had been through. She was struggling to provide for our family, working like 60 to 80 hours a week in this like diner. A lot of that money went to acting classes, um, like comp cards, like me getting new photos, me putting together a reel, things that she didn't have additional funds for, but she found a way to get them so that I could have the things that I wanted, so that I could pursue these passions that I had. And um, I just remember like her being so disappointed, but so loving at the same time. In that moment, she was saying, I love you, but you're better than this. Why did you do that? And I definitely was quick to avoid her call, like after that. And then after that, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And then right on time, I get a phone call from the agent. Everything went well, I heard, and the, the scene is performing really well, and I'd actually like to offer you a contract. When we make bad decisions, I believe it's easy to think, well, I have to continue doing what I'm doing. Because I've done one thing, I might as well do this. If you believe that lie to be true, then it's true to you. That lie is how you see reality. And I believed that I couldn't do anything else. So when I got that phone call offering this contract, I took it. I started thinking, well, in a way, this is who I am. Regardless of what it is that I'm doing, I want to be the best at it. It's the way that I validate myself. I thought like, okay, well, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be the best. So over a six year period, I did a little over a thousand films. I woke up, I worked out, showered, I went to set, I came home, I got takeout, and it was, that was pretty much every day. That was my job. Towards the end of my career, I was usually making between twenty dollars to $22,000 a month. I was nominated for about 18 different awards, and for me, it was validation. Best male performer, so like, you know, the, the highest award that a, a guy could win in the industry. and. I thought if I won that award, I would be happy. In the last year I was in the industry, I, I won that. It didn't work. And when it didn't work, I started thinking, if this isn't making it, if this isn't joy, if this, is, if this doesn't equate to happiness, where do I go from here? No one's gonna wanna marry me. No one's gonna wanna hire me. No one's gonna take me seriously. Maybe I should just die. I did one last movie and then um, I made a plan. For some reason I decided to stop at a bank um, before I carried out that plan. I hand the teller the check and then I go to walk away. And before I do, she says, Joshua, can I help you? I just froze. 
And then she says, Joshua, can I do anything for you? And um, I just stood there for what seemed like an awkward amount of time and then just bolted and just wept. She said my name. Six years prior, this agent says, I'll make your name famous. But actually the first thing you do when you decide to go in that industry is you get rid of your name and you start going by another name. And that name had became famous. Joshua didn't exist. And during that process, I pushed away everyone in my life that I had a real relationship with. I surrounded myself with people who applauded what I did and anyone that challenged me, I just pushed them away. So I hadn't heard my name in well over a year. And when that bank teller said my name, it just, it shattered this numbness, this, this plausible reality that I'd created based on pain, guilt, and shame. I go home and I, and I weep and I, I have this, again, this, this ironically the same conversation in the mirror that I had six years prior when I did the first scene, when I'm asking myself, you know, what am I doing? I call my mom and she said, just please come home. So I did. That was it. When you leave the industry, more often than not, you haven't had a lot of education. I'd gotten into CrossFit. I found a gym in Raleigh, North Carolina. I quickly found out that $20 an hour, working 10 hours a week, wasn't gonna cut it. I had gone from making you know, nearly $300,000 a year to um, stocking and cleaning a cooler at a Whole Foods and then I went straight to the gym and I would clean the parking lot and the bathrooms and then coach there for the evening. It was quite the transition. <laughs> there was this girl who would always walk into class one minute late. She was by far the like fittest person in the class, gorgeous, and just you know super attracted to her. And I said, I would love to take you out to dinner. Um, what's your favorite food? She's like, I think I'm okay. And then she's like, well, we could go for a run. And I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> and we meet at this park. I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I'm excited. And then I just like feel like I get this like lump in my throat of just like, don't you dare lie to her. Just tell her the truth. And before our run started, I was like, hey, I wanna tell you something. And um, I was like, I did, a little bit of porn and she was like what do you mean and I, I was I told her everything and she's just looking at me like deer in headlight and then she said I want you to know that I don't believe a person's defined by the worst thing they've ever done I believe that God he defines who a person is do you know who God is I'm, okay like yeah I, I, I know who God is and then she pressed in a little more and was like, well, you know, what's your relationship with Jesus like? You know, what's your prayer life look like? Are you, you know, do you go to church anywhere? Are you like, are you part of any community? I'm just like, I, I no, I, 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 I guess maybe I, I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. And then she's like, well, it's how I live my life. I'm not perfect by any means, but Jesus is at the center of my life. And she's like, well, what's, your, what's some of your goals? What are some of your aspirations? Like, tell me about yourself. And I was just like, you don't want me to leave? Later on that, um, that weekend, she was like, hey, um, there's this church that a lot of people at the gym that they go, would you be interested in going? And I was like, sure. And we go to this church and we walk in and there's this pastor who walks on stage. He's wearing jeans and a t-shirt. And he's just sharing that his relationship with Jesus changed the way that he saw the world and changed his life. Talking about how Jesus meets us where we are and how the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. If God's standard is perfection, and if we have all fallen short because of our sin, there's, there's nothing that we can do. 
and Jesus becomes perfection for us. He lays down his life and gives us access to his righteousness because of his life. And if we put our faith in him, we gain access to that. Why? Like, why would Jesus do that? Because we were good enough? No, because he loves us. So, I mean, in that moment, I'm like weeping, snots flying, felt like an idiot, but was okay with it. That's the moment my life changed. This girl that I, I tried to um, take on a date, it was tough. It was, it was really challenging for me. And it was almost awkward at times because we're gonna abstain from, from anything. I was conditioned where if, like, if I was alone with a girl, like we're gonna have sex, like what else will we do? To, to anyone that believes they can't stay abstinent, it doesn't matter if you've had sex with a thousand people, you can choose to walk in purity today because purity is not about God, it's about you. It's about what God has for you. What's really neat about her is she's my wife. <laughs> and um, we've been married for six years and we have three boys. And, and I experienced a level of intimacy for the first time. I fell in love like every second with her. Doesn't even compare to anything else I've ever experienced because it's not the same thing. What allowed me to experience everything with a freshness and a newness with hope was number one, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, that person I used to be is dead and gone and I'm a new creation. I have a new heart, a new spirit, a new purpose, new mind. And then also what I'm experiencing with her is sacrificial and it cost me more. It cost you way more to love someone that it does to experience an act of lust. Is it gonna be hard? Yes. <laughs> is, is, is it gonna be difficult and challenging? Will you stumble along the way? Yes. But gosh, freedom is worth it. Life is worth it. Finding purpose is worth it. Laying your head down on the pillow and knowing that you're living your life in such a way that lines up with not only the the creator of the world who made you, but you're doing the thing that he made you to do. And, and ultimately that's to be in a relationship with him. And that is where satisfaction is found. That's where healing is found. Regardless of what you've done, where you've been, who you are, the gospel is for you. I just wanna encourage you that whatever it is that you're struggling with, you're not alone and there's nothing that you could ever do to out sin or outrun God's love for you because he died for you so that you could know him, so that you could experience healing, so that you could be free. Pull the, pull the, thank you for watching, sharing, ringing that bell and dropping a comment below. We love creating these inspirational faith stories for you and thousands of others. Now, all the stories on this channel are brought to you in partnership with Impactus and are donor funded, which means people have given so that you can be encouraged in your faith. Yeah, people care that much about you. And today, we'd like to invite you to be a part of this mission with us. This Is Me TV exists to encourage and empower the online generation to live unashamed for God and use their God-given gifts to influence culture. We do this by creating stories like the one you've just watched. And to date, we've had over 1.8 million viewers watched and be encouraged in their faith right here. It's mind blowing to see how God has and will continue to use This Is Me TV. So would you be willing to join us today and help us equip this generation for a life of purpose and godly impact? The link's below or head on over to impactus.org. Much love from us all and thank you so much for considering this partnership.